Howdy y'all, welcome back. This video is about to be crazy. First of all, this is going to be the second upload of this video about the 1900 Expo in Paris. The first time I uploaded this video, one of the very first images was a panoramic shot scrolling across the Expo, showing all of the unimaginable buildings that were all said to be constructed temporarily for this World's Fair. And this was maybe 13 or 14 buildings. It was one of the most detailed photographs in the entire video. Well, as soon as I uploaded this video, that was hit with a claim. Someone said that they owned that photograph and that it was not allowed to be shown online. What's wild about that is all of these images are over 100 years old. They are all free use. So for someone to be able to even claim that is absolutely wild to me. Let's get right into this hidden history. Howdy y'all, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a walk through the 1900 World's Fair, the Universal Exhibition in Paris, France. This World's Fair ran from April the 14th to November the 12th, 1900, and it was visited by more than 50 million people, according to the current narrative. All of these exhibits sat on over 530 acres of land. This was not Paris's first World's Fair, however. They had one in 1855, a second in 1867, a third in 1878, a fourth in 1889, celebrating the centennial of the French Revolution, and finally, the 1900 World's Fair which we will be looking at in detail today. A lot of people want to focus on the architecture of the 1900 World's Fair in Paris. And as we look at the architecture, we must understand that this architecture was built to go hand in hand with the new technologies, the founded technologies, the inherited technologies that were being displayed and showcased to the world for the first time. These technologies this advancement included the Grand Rue de Paris a 315 foot Ferris wheel which you might have seen before this was the tallest wheel in the world a title that it held for nearly 90 years this great wheel was financed by the Paris gigantic wheels and varieties company which sold shares to finance the construction the wheel was disassembled almost directly after the fair, and the pods ended up being used as huts for traveling merchants. Eventually, these large passenger pods, which each one could hold most likely 50 or more people, they were renovated and they were actually transformed into housing for poor French families that were devastated after the First World War. Quite an incredible narrative here. And that's just the massive Ferris wheel. Another major accomplishment was the Street of the Future, also known as the Moving Sidewalk, or Electric Moving Walkway. It passed through nine different stations while moving throughout the fair, allowing passengers to board or exit at each one. The Moving Sidewalk was designed by architect Joseph Lyman Silsby and engineer Max Smith the same team who designed the first ever moving sidewalk in the world that appeared at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. The propulsion system was provided for each sidewalk by a roller acting by friction on a beam that was fixed along the center line of the track and these were two by two provided with two pairs of wheels carried and guided by side rails established underneath the floor. This entire system ran on direct current and would complete an entire loop of the fairgrounds in roughly 26 minutes when it was on its fastest setting. As far as things at the 1900 Paris World's Fair that made their first appearance or were introduced to the world for the first time, we have the first trolley bus, the first escalator, the first diesel engines, the first electric automobiles, the first dry cell batteries, the first fully electric fire engines, 
the first film with sound, and this was made by the Lumiere brothers. The first magnetic audio recording and the first nesting or Russian tea dolls. The 1900 World's Fair in Paris was over 10 times larger than the first World's Fair held in Paris in 1855. The exposition buildings were meant to be temporary. They were built on iron frames covered with plaster and staff. Staff being a composition of powdered gypsum, glycerin, hemp, and water. We're told that staff was invented in Paris for the 1878 World's Fair and continued to be used in all World's Fairs from that point forward, still being used in some temporary buildings and structures even to this day. Nearly all of the buildings were said to be unfinished when the 1900 World's Fair opened and most were demolished immediately after it closed. The Great Exhibition Telescope, for example, was an objective lens that was 49 inches in diameter and was the largest refracting telescope ever constructed in the world up until that time. It was known as the scientific centerpiece to the 1900 Paris Expo. Oddly, we're told members of the French sciences had been pushing for the founding of the world's largest telescope since as early as 1892, making it all the stranger that the telescope was sold for parts less than a decade after the exhibition was over. We're told the most detailed photographs ever taken of many heavenly bodies up until that time were achieved using this great exhibition telescope, including the most detailed photographs ever taken of the face of the moon. We also have the great aquarium of the 1900 exhibition. Not only was this the largest aquarium in the world at the time of its completion, but it was also constructed with a massive 2,369 foot long underground gallery built directly beneath the aquarium, allowing fairgoers to look up into the largest aquarium in the entire world. It goes without mentioning, but certainly a lofty and timeless creation of the 1900 World's Fair was the unmatched Eiffel Tower. Initially, the Eiffel Tower was created for the 1889 World's Fair in Paris, but it was renovated and fully painted and fully illuminated for the 1900 exhibition. Going hand in hand with the new and improved Eiffel Tower was the Globe Celeste. Considered one of the largest and most detailed planetariums in the world, the globe-shaped structure was 148 feet in diameter, painted in complete detail and accented in gold. The Globe Celeste was also the site of a major accident at the 1900 World's Fair, when ramps made mostly of staff collapsed. As the globe was on top of 59 foot tall masonry supports, the ramp collapse was monumental. This event ended up taking the lives of nine, pushing the French government to establish their first regulations into the use of reinforced concrete and staff. For many people, the thing that makes the 1900 World's Fair in Paris single-handedly one of the most important events in history is how it was used to re-establish the Olympic Games as a staple of mankind. After centuries of being little more than a myth or a legend, the 1900 Summer Olympics were the second modern Olympic Games held and the first ones that were held outside of Greece coinciding directly with the 1900 World's Fair. 997 competitors took part in 19 different events, including women competing in the Olympics for the first time. A number of events were held for the first and only time in Olympic history at the 1900 Olympic Games in Paris, including automobile and motorcycle racing, ballooning and balloon racing, cricket, croquet, a 200 meter swimming obstacle race, and an underwater swimming race. There was a pigeon race. But for me, the real connection here throughout the entire exhibition is between Russia 
aka Old World Tartary, and Paris. No more is this apparent than in the balloon race of the 1900 Olympics, which would take balloons, dirigibles, and other airships in a spectacular race from Paris to Russia, with the winning vessel traveling the 1,196 miles in roughly 35 hours. The final award ceremony of the 1900 Olympics was held on August the 18th, 1900, and was attended by over 11,000 people, with over 3,000 grand prizes handed out. Not all of these prizes were for sport. There were over 8,000 gold medals handed out, over 13,000 silver medals, over 12,000 bronze medals, and over 8,000 honorable mentions. One company which catapulted into world fame from their 1900 World's Fair award was the Campbell Soup Company, who used this recognition on their labels moving forward. A few of these temporary structures were so important, so major, that they were actually made to be preserved. They were made to be permanent. We're not exactly told how this was done, but these buildings included the Grand Palace and the Petite Palace, as well as the two major bridges, one of which being the Port Alexandre III, again, dedicated directly to France's new relationship with Russia. Most of the Art Nouveau was destroyed immediately. Most of the architecture was destroyed immediately. The sculptures, the technology, and the advancements, all seemingly temporary, all excruciatingly painful to imagine existing for less than a year, just a mere moment in time. A small number of these temporary staff buildings were then made permanent, although the ways that this was done are not described fully in the narrative. For example, we have the Monumental Palace of National Manufacturers that was preserved and then moved just a few hundred meters away. This World's Fair in Paris, like many of the other World's Fairs, was said to be not financially successful. The official final cost was 119 million francs, while the total amount actually collected from admission fees was 126 million francs. However, there were unplanned expenses of 22 million francs or more for the French state, as well as 6 million francs for the city of Paris, bringing the total cost to 147 million francs, or a deficit of 21 million francs or more. The cost of admission to the fair was only one franc. As we look through the remaining rarest, oldest, and most unique photographs from the 1900 World's Fair in Paris, you'll begin to notice many similarities between the architecture in Paris and the architecture that was found at the World's Fairs in Buffalo and Chicago. I have videos on both of those World's Fairs as well, so after this one, you can use those videos to compare and contrast. These beautiful structures pieced together through years of behind closed doors planning throughout the numerous cities of the world appear as if they're all part of one larger plan for the world. Numbers and factoids and legacies aside, as we look through the photographs of the 1900 Paris World's Fair, can we, with a clear conscience, say that we believe each and every building, every structure, or the technology depicted was originally intended to be temporary, to be partial, to be functional only for a short period of time, to operate in some minimal capacity before being moved or removed or destroyed? Can we say that as we look at every single image, all of these structures fit that criteria? This would be the most beautiful temporary city in the entire world. With the current narrative, as predictable as ever, with sources seemingly trying to tie all of these earlier World's Fairs together, and with each one having implications and associations with Russia, with an eerily similar construction story passed from narrative to narrative, from World's Fair to World's Fair, it seems that there's a rabbit hole here that we're only beginning to step into. 
How can something or multiple somethings, how can all of these world's fairs, so exquisite, with so much written about them, still remain so mysterious to us, even to this day? I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please feel free to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel. I have hundreds of other videos just like this one with hundreds of photographs for your old world enjoyment. We hit all of the major photographic accomplishments today. We saw stereoscope or 3D images of the Paris World's Fair in 1900, as well as photochrome or highly detailed colorized images. We also have many unique views I've included from cutting edge cameras of the time themselves put on display for the public for the first time at the World's Fair in 1900. Each World's Fair tells its own story, but it tells us of a society that is looking for paradise. With Paris in 1900, I believe, being the most complex of all the World's Fairs. To visit one of these World's Fairs in the 19th century was to be part of something truly invaluable, and it was. But the question becomes, how many people attending really understood what was happening around them? How many were, for lack of a better term, just along for the ride? Can we confidently, and as historians, simply using our common sense, go through every photograph here depicting the 1900 World's Fair, looking at these sculptures, looking at the architecture, looking at the technology, looking at just how advanced everything was. And can we imagine that every single one of these creations, these devices, this architecture was meant to last for six months and then be destroyed? Can we full-heartedly believe that as we go through these photographs? That's all. If you want to leave your comments, do so down below. If you enjoyed this video, definitely check out my other videos. We can get into more topics just like this, talking about the world's fairs, the old world, the ancient technology, antiquitech as some call it, and the anomalies of our past. P.S. Before I chime out, we also have this amazing organ that was installed in one of these temporary buildings, this organ itself being one of the largest or the most powerful, the highest decibels in all of France at the time, which is amazing to think that this was a temporary structure. But beyond that, I also wanted to make sure I showed you all of the photochrome or high definition colorized images that were taken at the 1900 World's Fair in Paris. So I've included those at the end of the video for your enjoyment. If you see anything that stands out, let me know in the comment section down below. The 1900 Paris Expo was by far one of the most architecturally sound, the most technologically sound at a time period when we have competing aspects for different roles in society, whether it be for power or for transportation or for everyday hobbies. We have all of these new things that were introduced directly at the 1900 World's Fair in Paris. So hopefully this video taught you something or there was a little bit in this video, whether it was a photograph or a piece of information that stood out to you and could help you to do your own research. I'd love to hear about it down below. Please subscribe if you're not already, and we will talk again on the next video. I will see y'all there. Cheers.